Well, good evening, Temple Baptist. Hope you're doing well. I uh, hope you're having a great week uh, as we roll into another Wednesday. It's amazing how these weeks just begin to roll on. Uh, a couple of things I want you to continue to be faithful in. Uh, our prayer time with uh, the search committee. Uh, each one of us has those prayer prompts. Make sure you're spending time praying together. Such an important time in the life of Temple Baptist and I hope that you're finding great opportunities to pray together as we read these scripture together and we pray these together. I keep these right by my, right on my desk. So a part of my beginning in the morning is uh, opening up this prayer guide and reading the scripture and praying through that. So I hope you are enjoying that and praying for the search committee. We're in the book of James again tonight. Uh, we're going to be in chapter two. We're going to look at the uh, first 13 verses really. Uh, we're going to move rather quickly tonight. I got a lot I just want to share, uh, but just as way as in introduction, I had a guy ask me one time, uh, he said, are you a Christian snob? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's sort of a funny question. Uh, but he said, before you answer uh, that question, think about it uh, for yourself for a minute. Who outside your present circle of friends have you attempted to include in your life recently? So I want you to think about that. Who outside of your circle of friends have you uh, attempted to include in, in your life recently? And I don't know about you, but it was pretty surprising to me uh, when I did that. We often, uh, I think, all walk around with this sort of unpublished list uh, in our minds of people that we spend our time with that uh, we des would consider to be desirable people to get to know and undesirable people that we would really don't spend much time with or, or seek to build much of a relationship with. You know, some folks prefer to be around educated people. Others look down on those who are educated or, you know, we all just have our certain group that we're more comfortable with. You know, some of us would rather spend time with young people. Some of us would like to spend time with older people. Uh, and unfortunately, some have race preference or, or group pre preferences that we would rather not associate with. Uh, just to be honest, most of us want to be around people just like we are, sort of. Uh, and, and this isn't a new problem. Uh, th th this problem is old as Christianity itself. And James is going to deal with that uh, tonight in chapter 2. Uh, he's going to be writing here to, the, to the, basically the first century church. And, and he very clearly brought this problem uh, into light for them. So let's just jump in. I'm going to move quickly tonight. We see in the first verse that there's a, there's a principle here to remember. He says, my brother, do not hold uh, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Now, what a powerful verse. Don't hold the, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with partiality. And notice a couple of things. First of all, he addresses the readers as my brothers. So he's reminding us uh, that the problem he is about to discuss is a family concern. Uh, you know, whenever he uses that term, he's almost always getting ready to point something out that needs to be changed in, in their lives. And this issue in, in chapter 2 here is partiality or favoritism. Uh, the literal meaning of the word is to receive one's face. Partiality, or as it's translated in some versions, respecter of persons, is mentioned several times uh, in, in the New Testament. But in every other case, the subject of the verse is God. And it's expressed sort of in a, in a negative way. Uh, for example, Acts 10 says God does not show partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. Uh, then First Peter says God does not receive people by faith. Uh, God does not judge by externals. He judges by the heart. Uh, interestingly, uh, we find the, the phrase no difference occurs twice in the book of Romans. Uh, it's used uh, first in the reference to our human sinfulness. Romans 3, 22 and 23 says there's no difference for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And second, it's used with reference to God's grace that's been extended to all that call on him. Uh, in in uh, chapter 10, it says, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be be saved. So we see that use of the word is sort of important to notice. And there are a number of ways, if we think about it, uh, in which we show favoritism today. And even in, in the church uh, that we uh, find this happening, we can favor people based on their gifts. 
We can favor people based on their abilities. Who's the most important? The preacher, the sound guy, the deacon, the Sunday school teacher. Uh, it's kind of funny how this overlaps with the study that we're doing in 1 Corinthians, how there were vis the divisions within the church and different things. And so we often do that. We sort of uh, form a hierarchy just subconsciously of different jobs even in the church. The nursery worker, is, is that person more important than the greeter and the welcome ministry? The truth is that, that that one is not really better than the other. They're all just utilizing different gifts. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We can show favoritism sometimes based on the basis of personality or looks or economic standings. But none of those, we, it's important to know this, none of those has any place within the church of, of Christ. What James is telling us here is to not profess Christ or profess faith in Christ, and at the same time be some type of, of spiritual snob. Don't don't join those little cliques within the church that that, that uh, often uh, pop up in our lives. Every believer in the church, you know, is a part of the same body of Christ, and and those whom He deemed worthy to receive, uh, they all need to experience the same love, the same acceptance. And, and this is a problem, as we see, that was all the way back in the first century uh, where Paul is, I mean, James is dealing with this. So it's important to, to notice that. So he lays out, first of all, this principle to remember. And then secondly, there's a problem to remedy. Look at verse 2. It says, For if there should be in your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place or say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. So he sort of gives this analogy here. He gives this illustration. The first guest is identified as a man with gold rings. It's literally uh, in the language is gold fingered uh, or, or having many gold rings. But what we see is the abundance and the prominence of his jewelry and his fine apparel. is It's evident that he's dressed to be noticed and, and to be seen. That That's translated and that's transferred in that original language. The second man is identified as a man, a poor man, in filthy clothes. And filthy here is, is used to sort of think about maybe, maybe the guy that's been working all day and his clothes, he has his work clothes on and they're dirty, they're stained from work. Uh, so that's sort of the picture that we have here. And although it's hard to see in, in, the, in the modern English translations, the word you in, in verse 3 is actually plural. The King James does a good job when it uses the, the, the plural ye, so that we know that's plural. So it uses that plural there, and that use of the plural suggests that this was happening here was a general attitude of the whole group. Uh, th there's general attitude that's going on of this, of this whole group. Now, we, we got to understand there's nothing wrong with extending a warm welcome to, to a rich visitor. I mean, uh, that should be something we do naturally. The sin is pointed out when we see the, that, that we're treating the poor visitor differently. So uh, there, there was a distinction in the way these two visitors into the church were received or in the gathering were received. The rich man received, he was, he was received very open and, and he had the best seat in the house. And the poor man was received sort of carelessly, if, if not even rudely in here. And, and although these are just characters in, in a story and they're just an illustration, scenes like this actually do take place in, in churches all across America, you know, every time every time churches gather. And then in verse 4, we find the Lord's appraisal of this situation. He says, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So, so James's question to those showing favoritism is sort of a rhetorical question, and it anticipates an affirmative answer. Have you not shown distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Think about it for a second. If a judge in a court of law were to allow himself to be affected by the clothing that the defendant would wear, he would be violating justice. Uh, you know, and, and what James is saying here, for a Christian to accept or reject someone on the basis of an outward appearance is, is no less wrong than a judge making his verdict 
uh, based on what someone dresses or looks like. So that's that's the problem, the remedy. Uh, and then the third thing we notice here is we work through this passage beginning in verse 5. There's a perspective that we need to adopt into our lives. Uh, beginning in verse 5, James invites believers to adopt this new perspective, and he, and he does so by presenting three reasons why this favoritism or partiality is wrong. And, and, and the first reason, he says in verse 5, is it's inconsistent with, it's inconsistent with God's methods. Verse 5 says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who loved him? So if you think back uh, to some of the study we've done on Sunday mornings in 1 Corinthians, in in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote these words, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that is, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many mo- noble are called, but God has chosen, chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. So we see that same sort of, um, of understanding coming from Paul in 1 Corinthians. So the first thing to understand is, you know, God's method of choosing has always been grace, not, not anything about who we are or or how we can earn or what we have done or what our exterior looks like. So that's that first principle. The second principle is this. His favoritism is wrong because it's, it, it is inappropriate given the, the conduct of, of, of even the rich. Look at verse 6. But, who have, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you're called? So James is making his point here by asking a series of, of three questions. Who's oppressing you? Who's dragging you in, into court? And who's blaspheming the name uh, uh, that you're called by? The answer to all three of those is the unbelieving rich guy. So, And, and that's the one that you're going to show favoritism to? James says that, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, th- those are the ones that are treating you in, inappropriately. And then thirdly, he says it's wrong because it's indifferent to the truth that we see revealed in Scripture. If you look down at James 2, beginning in verse 8, he says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you are trans, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, as, as Christians, we're, we're called upon to live by this royal law, which is, is the law of love for our neighbor. Jesus outlines that, this royal law in Matthew 22, in his conversation with that young lawyer when he's asked, you know, what, what are the greatest commands and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, it, it's called the, the, the royal law because it's the, the su- supreme law of human relationships. And it was given by, by Jesus. And James quotes Jesus as saying, you shall love. And that word you, here we go, we got to pay close attention again to the, to the tense. It's, it's singular and points out a personal responsibility of every believer to do this. And the use of that phrase, but if you show partiality, recognizes that they may choose not to do so. And if you do so, you're choosing, you're choosing to commit sin. So he, he lays out this new perspective. So not only is there a new perspective that we need to adopt, but also there's a new practice that we need to implement, beginning in verse 12. So speak and do so as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So basically what he's saying is one of the tests of the reality of our faith is how we treat people. I mean, think about it. Could we pass that test? One of the main tests about our faith is how we treat people. And there's sort of a threefold reason given for our need to live consistently. Uh, and that is, you know, we're, we're reminded that we'll be judged. 
And, and think about our being judged. First of all, he tells us we'll be judged by our words. So that little phrase, so speak, is, is a present tense command or imperative that suggests that this is to be a habitual way of life. So, so when he says that, then so speak, he's, he's commanding us to do this, speak in a certain way. And then secondly, not only are we judge by the words, but we're judged by our deeds. So do, as he goes on to say, that's also a present tense imperative suggesting that ongoing habitual practice or way of life. So James has clearly shown that it's a sin to show this favoritism or, or partiality. So here's what I want you to do. It's sort of a, a practice uh, implementation of Scripture. I, I want you to think about who you're closest to within the church family. Well, where are the people uh, you hang out with, the, the people you fellowship with? Who, who are those people? I want you to think about those people for a second. Then I want to challenge you. How long has it been since you've reached out to include someone new in that circle? I mean, we, we have a tendency just to come into the church. We have a tendency to sit in the same spots. We have the tendency to talk to the same people because we're sitting in the same spots. And we have this tendency to, to really just sort of hedge ourselves off from the rest of the rest of the group. And I know it's a little bit different now with, with COVID and many of us aren't gathering in person. And, 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 and I understand that. But still, I want us to think about when is the last time we've really tried to bring someone else, someone new, into our group, and then maybe even someone that's different than us. You know, how, how long has it been since we've reached out to someone new and to bring them to be a part of that? Now, let, let me explain something to you. Why, why would you say this, you say? Well, I've read more books on, on, on church growth and, and how to be a great church, and I've read books on, uh, you know, leadership is important, good preaching is important, great music is all those things important. But at the end of the day, and listen, this is important, at the end of the day, relationships drive successful growing churches. Let, let me say that again. Relationships drive successful growing churches. Churches that are open, welcoming, grow, caring, those churches are often the churches that are growing. They're, they're not the churches that's dying. It's just, it's just that simple. Relationships are that important. Uh, where people feel welcome, where they feel to be a part of, uh, they're, going, they're going to come back to. And where they don't, uh, they're going to go somewhere else. And, and, and third and finally, he tells us that we're going to be judged not only by our, our words, and, uh, but he's going to, and our actions, but we're going to be judged by our attitudes. For either we've shown mercy or, or we've not, he says. So those are pretty important warnings that James gives us there. Now, let's just sort of wrap up. I, I, my time's running out. Uh, if, if we want to live in a close uh, relationship of just intimate fellowship with God, we must not only deal with the issues of sin in our actions, uh, in our words, but we also have to deal with the sins in our attitudes. Because here's what we're prone to do. Uh, often we excuse the sins of attitude. We typically judge the sins of action with harsh judgments. And, and we let the signs of, the, well, the sins of attitude just sort of get off easy. But the sins of attitude are often the spearhead of the sins of action. That's why repentance really deals with a change of mind. And, and so I want us to think about that. And I want us to think about our words and think about our actions and think about reaching out and think about uh, being impartial to people and being encouraging to people. Uh, there's a great story. You guys know I'm a baseball fan and I'm a, I'm a Dodgers fan, believe it or not, named after Sandy Koufax. But, but Jackie Robinson was the first uh, African-American to play Major League Baseball. And, and while breaking baseball's sort of color barrier, he faced a lot of different screams and, and, and jeers from the crowd in every stadium. And one day he's playing in his home stadium in, in Brooklyn. He committed an error, and his own fans just began to ridicule him. They, they stood at the, uh, the, the, the fence, and they were just yelling all types of things. They were just booing him. And here Jackie was standing at second base. He was just humiliated 
while the fans just shouted all these things to him. And then shortstop by the name of Pee Wee Reese uh, went over to Jack. He stood next to him. He put his arms around Jackie Robertson, and he faced the crowd. And the fans grew quiet. And Robinson would later say that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Simply going and putting his arm around his shoulder at that particular time saved his career. Wouldn't you like to be someone that makes that type of difference in someone else's life? So I want us to think about uh, being conscious about reaching out to others that may look different than us, uh, that may speak different than us, that may very well be different from us in many, many ways. To not do so is to not really live into our faith and be who Christ has called us to be. Man, I don't know about you, but James is challenging. As we read through this, the practicality of his message, it's convicting to us in many ways. And so I just want to challenge you this week uh, to think about ways of reaching out to others and even those that may be quite different than you. Let's take a moment and just end our time in prayer. Father, we're grateful for another opportunity to study your word. And Father, we ask now that we would, uh, Lord, allow your word to just uh, search our hearts, search our minds, Lord, that we can be, Lord, great vessels, Lord, to be used by you. And Lord, give us opportunities this week, Lord, that reach out to, to those, Lord, that may be different than us. Lord, allow us to be an encouragement to somebody. Lord, our words that we say are simple gestures Lord, can make uh, a great difference in people's lives. So, Lord, just use us in this upcoming week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Temple, you have a great evening. Excited to see you on Sunday morning. God bless.